today on It Takes a Killer. The discovery of a Jane Doe underneath a New Jersey bridge kickstarts an intensive investigation to figure out who she is and how she died. Law enforcement uses a combination of forensic evidence and eyewitness statements to solve both mysteries and bring an unlikely murderer to justice. Bristol Township, Pennsylvania, Wednesday, March 29th, 2000, 1.30 a.m. Rachel Siani sits down at the bar inside Divas International, a gentleman's club where she works. The 21-year-old, who goes by the stage name Roxanne, has been dancing at Divas to pay her way through psychology classes at Bucks County Community College. Rachel's shift ended three hours earlier. She had left the club for a while, but returned flustered and is now looking to have a drink. However, her manager, William Love, refuses to serve her as it's already past last call. Rachel hangs out till 2.15 in the morning, then exits the club with another dancer named Rebecca Yavorsky. A bouncer walks them to Rachel's car. Rachel drops her purse and a bag of food into the front seat, then walks with Rebecca back to her car so they can talk. For the next 20 minutes, the girls smoke weed as Rachel explains how she's frustrated from an incident that happened after her shift. Apparently, Rachel had planned to hang out with Ken, the DJ at Divas, but he didn't want her coming over. Rebecca takes a photo of Rachel to cheer her up. Meanwhile, Officer Kevin Burns pulls into the Divas parking lot to fill out an incident report. He observes Rachel and Rebecca talking inside the car. Before long, Officer Burns sees a man in a green jacket, jeans, and dark shoes walk up to the front door of Divas. The man starts banging on the door, which is odd because it's after 2.30, well past closing time. Burns radios headquarters and asks them to contact Divas to see if there's a problem. As Rebecca drives Rachel over to her car, Rachel sees the man banging on the club door and recognizes him as club regular Jack Denofa. She tells Rebecca she's gonna say hi to Jack real fast and then jumps out of the car. Jack is one of Rachel's best tippers, yet Rebecca is concerned because she knows Rachel is high and she also knows that Jack gets pretty intoxicated on nights he visits the club. Rebecca watches Rachel and Jack for a minute or so, then drives off. Officer Burns monitors Rachel and Jack as they talk outside the club. He soon observes them walk over to the Econo Lodge next to the club, enter the lobby and walk past the registration desk. After that, a call comes over the radio, forcing Burns to leave. The following night, Thursday, March 30th, Rachel fails to show up for her shift. Yet her car has been parked in the same spot outside Divas International for nearly two days. Burlington Township, New Jersey, Saturday, April 1st, 2000, 10 a.m. Richard Scott is riding his ATV in a field below the Delaware River Turnpike Bridge when he comes across a woman lying face down in the grass. Fearing the woman jumped from the bridge in a suicide attempt, Scott drives his ATV to the nearest police station to get help. The New Jersey State Police dispatch multiple officers to the scene. Detective John Villamil finds the woman's body just 50 yards off River Road. Insect activity indicates she's been there for several days. The woman is wearing a white sweater, jeans, and clean white socks. Her shoes are nowhere to be found. There don't appear to be any tire tracks or drag marks in the vicinity, so it's unlikely the woman was driven or carried there. Investigators conclude she must have fallen from the bridge above as there are indentations in the ground next to the body. Yet when Detective John Garkowski inspects the body, he finds evidence inconsistent with a bridge fall. The woman's chest is on the ground, but there's blood coming out of her left ear, which is skyward. There's also dried blood on her temple. These findings suggest the woman had been injured before she hit the ground. Villamil and Garkowski head to the bridge deck to check for clues. On the deck, they find pieces of white fibers lodged between sections of a concrete retaining wall. The fibers seem to be consistent with the deceased woman's sweater. They also find blood on the wall's exterior, which is swabbed and collected for analysis. The bridge is covered in dirt and debris, which would have transferred to the woman's socks if she jumped herself. But since the victim's socks were clean, detectives theorized someone threw her over the side. On Sunday, April 2nd, Dr. Dante Regassa autopsies the Jane Doe at Virtua Memorial Hospital. The victim has multiple head injuries, including fractures to the left and right parietal temporal region, as well as a severe hinge fracture at the base of the skull. She has a fractured left mandible, two fractured vertebrae, fractured thyroid cartilage, 
contusions to the face, a punctured liver, and a lacerated kidney. Ragasa rules the death a homicide caused by injuries from a fall. However, he does find it suspicious that she had bled prior to death. It's clear the woman suffered a violent encounter prior to falling from the bridge, as parts of her fingernails had broken off, a sign she'd fought her assailant. Burlington police didn't find any ID on the victim, so they release a description of her to the news media, hoping a viewer can identify her. That Sunday, William Love, the manager of Divas International, calls police. Love saw a news report describing the victim as wearing a white sweater, jeans, and a butterfly pendant around her neck. He immediately recognized the outfit and the necklace as what his dancer, Rachel Siani, had been wearing five nights prior. Law enforcement checks the victim's fingerprints and confirms that it is, in fact, Rachel Siani. Later that day, Bristol Township Police Detective Victor Tunis visits Divas International. He locates Rachel's car in the parking lot and goes through it. He finds her purse, food, a cup of noodles, some joints and rolling papers, Prozac and money. Yet nothing looks out of the ordinary, and it doesn't appear she'd been robbed or carjacked. Tunis goes inside and speaks with some of the dancers, who mentioned to him that Spike Davis, a cook who used to work at Divas, had been obsessed with Rachel. In fact, Davis had been fired a month prior because of his fixation with her. William Love tells Tunis, Rachel last worked Tuesday the 28th from 4 to 10 p.m. Toward the end of her shift, he saw Rachel with Diva's regular, Jack Denafa. A dancer named Buffy, who worked from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. that night, remembers seeing Denofa arrive at the club just after she started her shift. According to Buffy, Denofa asked Rachel to come with him to Sportster's Bar and Grill, but Rachel refused to go, telling Denofa she was too tired. Buffy claims that Jack left the club between 10 and 10.30 to go to Sportster's alone, saying he'd return later. On Monday, April 3rd, investigators call Officer Kevin Burns down to headquarters. Burns had been parked in his squad car in the Divas lot the night of Rachel's disappearance. He picks out Jack Denofa from a six-pack as the guy he'd witnessed pounding on the club's door. When officers show Burns a picture of Rachel Siani, he confirms she's the brunette he saw enter the hotel with Denofa. Investigators desperately want to know what happened after that and how Rachel's evening ended with her falling to her death from the Delaware River Turnpike Bridge. Coming up. Cops piece together Rachel Siani's final moments, and all the connections point back to a familiar friend. You're watching It Takes a Killer. In early April 2000, police in central New Jersey are investigating the death of 21-year-old exotic dancer Rachel Siani, who was found below the Delaware River Turnpike Bridge. Blood and clothing fibers from the bridge's deck seem to indicate that the college student did not commit suicide, but instead had been thrown off by someone else. Rachel was last seen around 2.40 in the morning on March 29th, leaving the gentleman's club where she worked, Divas International, with club regular Jack Denofa. A cop observed Rachel and Denofa enter the Econo Lodge Hotel next door. Cops want to speak with Denofa, but first they question Diva's former cook, Spike Davis. Davis had been fired from the establishment a month prior due to his infatuation with Rachel. Davis denies having any involvement in Rachel's death and claims he hasn't seen her for several weeks. But it's possible his unrequited love and the loss of his job as a result could have given a motive to want to hurt Rachel. Early in the investigation, detectives speak to former Divas dancer Michelle Bupp, who bartends at Sportster's Bar and Grill. She'd spent time with Jack DeNafa before he met up with Rachel back at the club. Bupp explains how just after midnight on March 29th, Jack arrived at Sportster's in a cab. He stayed there for several hours and consumed enough drinks that she cut him off. Eventually, she drove him back to the Econo Lodge next to Divas. Bupp dropped DeNafa off between 2 and 2.15 in the morning. Less than a half hour after that, Denofa met up with Rachel at the club and brought her back to the hotel. When police finally speak with Denofa, he's adamant he had nothing to do with what happened to Rachel Siani. Denofa does admit that Rachel accompanied him back to the Econo Lodge, but says she never went up to his room. According to him, they just went their separate ways after that. Investigators speak to Diane Crouch, who was the night auditor at the Econo Lodge on March 28th. Crouch says Jack Denofa checked in at 11.16 p.m. She personally handed him the keys to room 223. Crouch is familiar with Denofa, as he's a frequent guest at the hotel. 
Crouch confirms that soon after checking in, Nofa left the hotel in a cab. He returned around 2 or 2.15 in the morning, then walked in the direction of Divas. Crouch was busy with her duties, so she never saw Jack enter the hotel with Rachel Siani. However, she does recall that when he checked out, he was alone and smelled strongly of soap. A checkout receipt indicates that Denofa left the hotel at 4.03 a.m., but Crouch says it's inaccurate. She says he actually checked out 30 to 45 minutes prior to that, but she didn't enter the information until she'd finished running her computer audit. On April 3rd, New Jersey State Police Detective John Villamil and Bristol Township Police Detective Victor Tunis execute a search warrant on room 223 at the Econo Lodge. CSI swabs for evidence, but the room has been cleaned several times since Jack Denofa checked out. Investigators do find a small speck of blood in the shower stall, which they then collect for testing. When the detectives open the window and look down, they can see a large dark red spot on the sidewalk directly below the 30-inch wide window ledge. Villamil heads to the ground floor to investigate. Villamil places a piece of white paper over the stain. To his shock, the paper absorbs red blood. He orders CSI to swab the five inch wide by 30 inch long stain for DNA evidence. Investigators begin developing a theory about what happened to Rachel Siani in the pre-dawn hours of March 29th. They believe Rachel did go up to Jack Denofa's hotel room, but the reason she didn't check out with him after 3 a.m. is because he threw her off the second story window of room 223. They conclude that Denofa then checked out, retrieved Rachel's body from the ground below his room, and put it into the back of a red Dodge truck, which his hotel receipt listed as the car he was driving. Then he drove away to dispose of the body. Detectives eventually tracked down the man who rented the room directly beneath Denofa's on the night of March 28th. The man tells police he remembers being awakened in the middle of the night by a loud thump or thud. Around 5.45 on the morning of the 29th, he left the hotel and found a set of keys on the ground next to the driver's side of his truck, which had been parked right outside the room where Detective Villamil found the red stain. He turned the keys over to Diane Crouch. When officers show the keys to Divas dancer Rebecca Yavorsky, she recognizes them as Rachel Siani's. Rachel had been holding them as they sat and talked in her car just before she walked off with the NOFA. On Wednesday, April 5th, investigators review surveillance footage from the Pennsylvania Turnpike exit, a minute's drive from the Econo Lodge. They assume Denofa took the turnpike to the Delaware River Bridge and tossed Rachel Siani over the side. At 3.13 a.m., the cameras captured Denofa's red truck entering and exiting the eastbound toll booth at Interchange 29. The shape of a human body can clearly be seen at the tail end of the truck bed. The person has on a white colored top and white socks, which matches the clothing Rachel Siani was wearing when police recovered her body. By 3.31 a.m., the same red truck heads back west to Pennsylvania on the turnpike, arriving back at Interchange 29 at 3.40. Investigators soon interview a woman named Melody Hall, who was behind Denofa at the toll booth that morning. Hall says she remembers seeing what looked like a person lying face up in the bed of the truck. According to Hall, the person was covered in a white drop cloth and wearing white socks and dark pants. Initially, she thought the person had passed out from being drunk, so she didn't report the incident at the time. Hall says she couldn't really see who was driving the truck, but believes the driver was a male based on the shape of his shoulders. Hall says the driver was wearing a dark jacket and his hair was slicked back like he'd recently taken a shower. This seems to coincide with what the Econo Lodge night order said about Denofa smelling strongly of soap when he checked out. Blood evidence they find on the pavement underneath Denofa's room leads detectives to speculate that Denofa pushed Rachel Siani out of the window. They theorize that he then subsequently loaded her body into his truck, drove to the bridge, and tossed it off. Surveillance footage from the Pennsylvania Turnpike clearly shows Denofa's truck pass through with what looks like a human body in the bed of his truck. Melody Hall, who was behind Denofa at the toll booth, remembers seeing a person lying face up in his truck bed. She thought the person was passed out drunk, but it was almost certainly Rachel Siani, dead. Bordentown, New Jersey. Wednesday, April 5th, 2000. State police examined Jack Denofa's red 1996 Dodge pickup which is sitting in their impound lot. The truck has been thoroughly cleaned, but once Detective John Garkowski removes the rear license plate frame, blood starts dripping down. Officers subsequently remove the plastic bed liner. They find blood stains on the underside as well as on the metal bed. Technicians take several blood samples for analysis. 
The New Jersey State Crime Lab soon reports back its findings on all of the evidence gathered in the course of the investigation. Blood from the shower stall inside Denofa's room at the Econo Lodge was too small to develop a DNA profile. The lab is able to determine that the blood swab from the bridge retaining wall is human, but they cannot identify its contributor due to environmental exposure. Despite those setbacks, a blood sample from the Econo Lodge sidewalk and another sample from the underside of Denofa's plastic truck bed liner both match back to Rachel Siani. It's definitive proof that Denofa was in close proximity to Rachel at the time of her death. On Friday, April 7th, Dr. Farouk Preswala conducts a follow-up autopsy of Rachel Siani. Preswala finds pinhead-sized hemorrhages in both of Rachel's eyes, as well as on her facial skin, which usually indicates mechanical asphyxia. This suggests Rachel could have been put into a chokehold, which could have made her pass out, but would not have killed her. Preswala concludes that the severe hinge fracture at the base of her skull came from falling out of the hotel room and resulted in a large-scale bleeding from the head and ears. Ultimately, Dr. Preswala determines that Rachel Siani's death was due to a combination of the head injury she sustained falling out of the hotel window and the lacerated liver she suffered falling from the bridge. Later that Friday night, cops arrest Jack Denofa at his home in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. In May 2001, a Burlington County grand jury indicts Jack Denofa for first-degree murder. The question remains, who is Jack Denofa, and why would he kill Rachel Siani, one of his favorite dancers, at his favorite gentleman's club? John Jack Denofa was born in Pennsylvania in June of 1965. By the time of his arrest, he lives in the Philly suburb of Buckingham with his wife, Lisa. They have no children, but are very active in the community. Jack appears to be the well-liked chairman of his high school alumni association, an avid pool player, and has no criminal history, except for a September 1999 DUI charge. By day, Denofa works as a self-employed sign painter. But Tuesday night, he routinely visits Divas International. Apparently, Denofa's wife knows about his affinity for the club and often drives him there, expecting that he'll stay at the Econo Lodge to avoid driving while intoxicated. Most of the dancers think Jack is the ideal patron. He's friendly, respectful, and tips generously. Yet Denofa does have an aggressive side, which sometimes comes out after he's been drinking. One club employee says he can fly off the handle over little things when he doesn't get what he wants. Everyone at Divas knows Jack Denofa's favorite girl was Rachel Siani. Rachel eventually makes so much money just from sitting and talking to Denofa that she doesn't have to dance on stage or give private dances to any other customers. On occasion, Rachel stays after her shift to talk to Jack. She refers to him as a sucker to the other dancers, yet grows to trust him, which ultimately proves to be her downfall. Coming up, the final dance for Jack Denofa. Mount Holly, New Jersey, Tuesday, November 5th, 2002. The Jack Denofa murder trial gets underway at Burlington County Superior Court. The prosecution alleges that in the pre-dawn hours of March 29th, 2000, Jack Denofa killed Rachel Siani because he was smitten with her and she did not reciprocate his affection. Prosecutors present multiple witnesses who testify that that night Denofa invited Rachel back to his hotel room. They believe once Jack got Rachel inside his room, he made some kind of advance that she rebuffed. Intoxicated, he snapped and killed her. The state argues that Jack most likely strangled Rachel until she passed out. Prosecutors speculate that Jack may have thought Rachel was dead from the strangulation, but she wasn't. His efforts to get her out of the window and to his truck caused her to fall to the sidewalk. The fall left Rachel with a fractured neck, but also left behind the large blood stain and her keys. It's assumed that Jack showered or otherwise cleaned up in some capacity. The hotel's night auditor recalled him smelling strongly of soap when he checked out, and another driver on the turnpike had seen him with slick back hair. The state argues that Jack pulled over on the side of the empty Delaware River Turnpike Bridge, dragged Rachel's body out of the bed of his truck, and tossed it 112 feet to the ground below. The traumatic injuries from the impact finally killed her. Ultimately, the DNA evidence and surveillance videos from the turnpike toll booth showing a human body in his truck provide damning proof that Jack Denofa was the last person to see Rachel Siani alive. Denofa's defense team doesn't deny he had contact with Rachel before she died, but maintains that he didn't kill her. 
Denofa's attorney maintains that with no eyewitnesses to actually verify the person driving Denofa's truck was Jack Denofa himself, there's reasonable doubt he committed the murder. The argument hangs on the idea that someone else transported Rachel's body to the bridge using Denofa's truck. Denofa's attorney uses testimony from a cook named Douglas to point out that Diva's employees often took Jack's keys from him to prevent him from driving while intoxicated. By that logic, any number of people could have had access to his keys and driven his truck that evening. The defense also argues that Rachel occasionally partied with bikers and other rough individuals, and that one of them could have killed her. They don't call any expert witnesses to the stand, and Denofa does not testify on his own behalf. On November 20th, 2002, the jury finds Jack Denofa guilty of the first-degree murder of Rachel Ciani. Ultimately, Denofa is sentenced to life in prison, where he'll serve a mandatory 30 years before becoming eligible for parole. Here's a case where the guy that sat next to her, the victim every night just wanting to talk to her, a guy described as being a nice guy, turned out to present the biggest danger to her after all. And in the end, Jack could have saved her life at many different points along the way. Instead, he kept doing things prolonging her agony until she finally died.